Hello, welcome to the Public Service Ethics Training hosted by San Joaquin County Human Resources Staff Development Unit. All staff, regardless of status, whether full-time, part-time, temporary, or seasonal, are required to take this course once in their tenure. At the end of this training, you will need to complete the training acknowledgement form and submit it to SJC Engage in order to get this course added to your PeopleSoft training record. There are several things that we hope you gain from going through this training. We want to make sure that we're shedding light on the topic of ethics in the workplace, more specifically, that in public service. We want to be able to help employees understand their ethical responsibilities as a public servant and be aware of your duties and responsibilities. We want to be able to help employees avoid unethical behavior and avoid some common mistakes. We also want you to understand common misconceptions around ethics. At the end of this training, there will be a self-assessment of some ethical competencies that we will go over. We want you ultimately to be able to identify ways to handle unethical situations. Ethics can be defined in many ways. Public service ethics isn't just about doing the right thing, it's about the public confidence that the right thing is being done on their behalf. Public servants must maintain a high standard of ethical conduct. Our first role is to be in service to the community. The interest of the public should be our target, not personal or private interests. Public servants should not benefit financially from their positions. San Joaquin County has a policy on ethics. You can review that policy in the supplemental documents associated with this training. There is a difference between ethics laws and ethics principles. Ethics laws are laws that affect your decisions. You are not able to accept gifts or tokens of appreciation as a county employee. This will violate laws. Conforming to ethics laws is the minimum compliance. California has a lot of laws surrounding public service ethics, and these laws can oftentimes be very complex. Some actions can be prosecuted under both state and federal law. The penalties for bribery are severe. Ethics transcends laws. While we know that conforming to ethics laws is the minimum level of ethical expectations, our ethic principles take us beyond those minimum expectations. Just because a course of action is legal doesn't mean that it is ethical. When you think of ethics principles, you want to think in terms of values or morals. This often goes beyond the letters of the law. There are six pillars of character that we want to address today. These are trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. The most expensive thing in the world is trust. It can take years to earn and just a matter of seconds to lose. The quote helps to remind us about the damage that a loss of trust can cause. Even if a loss of trust is forgiven, a loss of trust is never forgotten. You want to make sure that you're truthful even when it's difficult. Don't use public service for personal gain. Don't use false or inaccurate information and never accept gifts or other personal consideration in your role. Avoid actions that would cause people to question whether your decisions are based on personal interest or public interest. And don't make empty promises or lie by omission. There is a betrayal of public trust when you withhold information. Respect is for those who deserve it, not for those who demand it. Treat others the way you want to be treated. As a public servant, we're not here to judge people. We're here to provide a service. You want to make sure that you treat everyone that you interact with, with professionalism and respect. This includes your fellow employees, as well as the public in which we are in service to. Just remember the golden rule. Be approachable and open-minded. And one form of respect is to involve all appropriate stakeholders and make sure that their voice is at the table when necessary. With great power comes great responsibility. 
you want to make sure that you're working to improve the quality of life in the public. We really are responsible for being good stewards of our resources. We don't want to use county resources for personal benefit. We also want to make sure that we take responsibility for our own actions, even when it's tough. We want to maintain appropriate levels of confidentiality and not use information that we've acquired from our public position for personal advantage. This is true in the case of social media as well. You want to make sure that you express that your views are your own and not those of the county. You are the face of government. Your opinions can easily be construed as organizational policy. Be aware and cautious about your public displays. Be fair in all of your dealings for fear that you be judged in all of your actions. Honor the laws. Support the public's right to know things. You want to make sure that you're impartial. Don't favor those who have helped you or are in a position to help you. You also want to make sure that you excuse yourself from decisions that may affect you or your family's financial interests. Make sure to promote equality and treat people equitable. It's very important to be consistent. When in a dispute, look at the situation outside of your own vested interest in the outcome to decide what is right. We have an opportunity to change public belief about government employees. It starts with us. The simple act of caring is heroic. Kindness is not just allowed or encouraged, it is expected. Be compassionate. You never know when someone's going through something. We're not here to judge anyone. We're here to provide a service. Express empathy. The ability to mentally and emotionally put yourself in the shoes of another person helps others feel heard, validated, and respected. A lack of empathy conveys apathy, disinterest, and condescension. How you react and interact with others directly affects their feelings toward the institution as a whole. Citizenship is the chance to make a difference in the place where you belong. By entering into a role in public service, you have made the decision to help support a system that is set in place to ensure the sustainability and success of our community. It is important that you do not take this responsibility lightly. You want to make sure that you're abiding by legal regulations and obligations to ensure adherence to lawfulness in your actions. Group interest should have priority over your own self-interests. The good of society is linked to the good of the community. Our most fundamental social problems grow out of a widespread pursuit of individual interests. There is a shared responsibility to ensure the sustainability of our environment. We're going to review the five principles of public service. These are public interest, objective judgment, political accountability, democracy, and integrity. As a public servant, your main goal should be for the advancement and sustainability of your community. Public employment is a trust to be used only to advance public interests, not personal gain. Use your best professional judgment and make decisions based on the information at hand and for the best interest of the community. Decisions are to be made on merits, free of partiality or prejudice, and unimpeded by conflicts of interest. There are many differences between the public sector, private sector, and nonprofit worlds. Everything in the public sector has an additional level of expected transparency. Ensure that any decisions that you make that may affect the public be addressed through the appropriate channels. Government is to be conducted openly, efficiently, equitably and honorably so the public can make informed judgments and hold public officials accountable. Honor and respect the democratic principles. Observe the letters and spirits of the law. Democracy is our most basic principle. It is the beginning of where all things start. Understand your role in the democratic process and uphold your oath as a county employee to protect it. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, especially if no one is around to witness it and not doing the right thing could lead to personal advancement or gain. Having integrity means that regardless of your personal gain or getting credit for making a right decision, you still make the
the right decision. Safeguard public confidence and the integrity of government by avoiding appearances of impropriety and conduct unbefitting a public employee. In this clip, we view ethics violations in the form of work time misconduct. Well, the woman who was Scott Walker's deputy chief of staff when he was Milwaukee County executive pled guilty to misconduct in office charges today. Lacey Crest is in the newsroom following that story. Lacey. Well, so far, four Walker aides have been charged, and today, Kelly Reinflush is the second aide to plead guilty to charges stemming from the John Doe investigation. After agreeing to a plea deal with the district attorney's office, Kelly Reinfleisch tried to plead no contest, but the judge would not allow it. You wish to change your plea? Yes, Your Honor. And what's your plea? Guilty. She pled guilty to misconduct in public office for campaigning for a lieutenant governor candidate while she was on the clock for the county. In an unusual move, Ryan Fleisch's defense attorney asked the judge to enter the guilty plea after the November election. So she has a last opportunity to vote. No. Governor Walker had been subpoenaed to testify in the case, but the district attorney admitted he did not plan on calling Walker to the stand. I released the governor from my subpoena about a week and a half ago. But Deputy District Attorney Bruce Landgraf says with aide Timothy Russell facing trial, Governor Walker could still testify in court. He is named in that complaint, and that would be a reason for possibly talking with the governor. Uh, but it remains to be seen whether he would have to testify in that case. And the judge could sentence her to three and a half years behind bars. All other charges against her have been dropped in the agreement. She'll be sentenced in the end of November. On your side, live in the newsroom, Lacey Crisp, today's TMJ4. Lacey, thank you for that update. Embezzlement and misconduct are some of the most devastating hits to the reputation of any agency. If we lose that public trust, it is not easy to regain, if ever. Wednesday evening and thanks for joining us for News 19 at 7. I'm Darcy Strickland. JR has the evening off. Florence County Sheriff Kenny Boone appeared at the Richland County Courthouse today. He's been indicted on charges of embezzlement and misconduct in office. News 19's Alicia Nieves joins us now with the latest. For each count of embezzlement, the indictment says Boone spent no more than $10,000 for personal use for each count. Attorney General Alan Wilson announced the indictment this morning. Boone faces one count of misconduct in office and two counts of embezzlement. He was arrested this morning without incident and read the indictment in court today. In the document, it claims Boone used both county and federal funds from the Florence County Sheriff's Office for his personal use. Specifically, the document says Boone stole the money from a federal narcotics account and spent it on items such as bicycles, groceries, coolers, cooking appliances, baseball equipment, electronics, window tinting, and clothing. Prosecutors requested that Boone not have contact with anyone in the sheriff's department, and he is to be on house arrest until he gets an attorney. Uh, totally cooperated this morning, and um, you know, this is a surprise to me. Uh, you know, what I understand has been going on since November. And uh, it's the first time I've heard of any of this, and, uh, but I have cooperated with them totally. I don't have a problem with that. If convicted for misconduct in office, Boone could face up to 10 years in prison and up to five years in a fine for the embezzlement charge. Boone has since been suspended from office. His bond was set at $50,000. At the Richland County Courthouse, Alicia Neaves, News 19, WLTX. Alicia, thank you. A judge has ordered Boone to remain under electronic monitoring as he awaits trial. He's at least the 10th South Carolina sheriff indicted or accused of criminal activity in the past decade. Today, the interim sheriff talked about the plans for the department. Governor Henry McMaster put Billy Barnes in charge. He had been the Florence County Sheriff before, serving from 1974 through 1993. He said he's asking for SLED to audit the sheriff's office's finances to make sure that everything is above board following the embezzlement charges against Boone. This office has suffered a black eye today. We're going to do everything possible to correct that. And I would ask that the citizens of Florence County not rush to judge this department. Kenny Boone was the only person indicted and charged with a crime. Our sheriff's office is made up of dedicated, professional law enforcement officers. Well, Barnes went on to say he will be able to focus on stabilizing the situation because he has no interest in running for that office again. 
A multitude of violations are conducted in this scenario. Pay close attention to all of the violations and how each one is being viewed. In the resort town of Chelan, known as a vacation spot, prosecutors were attending a three-day legal conference at Campbell's Resort. But after hours, the partying and drinking got out of hand. According to 91 pages of investigative documents released by the Snohomish County Prosecutor's Office today, this photo shows four deputy prosecutors around a topless, passed out female employee for the county's juvenile court. Her image was blacked out by the prosecutor's office before releasing the photo, which elected prosecutor Mark Rowe spoke with King Five about last week. I don't know exactly how she came to be exposed in that fashion on the top half of her body. But there is some nudity in that photo. There is. You can, you can see uh, parts that most people generally prefer not be seen. Um, in a situation like that, I certainly don't want pictures taken of. 29-year Deputy Prosecutor Chris Dickinson, seen here next to his topless girlfriend, was fired last month. Sometime after the photo was taken, the pair was asked to leave the motel room party. Later that night, she was arrested on Lake Chelan for boating under the influence while trying to get back to her motel room. Dickinson was arrested for DUI when he went to the county jail to pick her up. The two motel room photos of the topless woman were taken by one of several deputy prosecutors in the room. A young DPA took the photo because uh, he was appalled at the actions of you know, primarily Mr. Dickinson and he thought it should be documented in some fashion so that he could be held accountable for that. The thumbs up, smiling prosecutors in the foreground told an investigator they just saw the camera pointed at them and, quote, my gesture was in no way connected to the topless woman in the background. The deputy who took the photo was given this reprimand for photographing an unconscious woman, no matter his intention. This week, the woman filed a complaint with Chelan sheriffs over that photo. Dickinson is also under a separate sheriff's investigation for groping a female prosecutor at this party. The allegation is that he reached around her and uh, squeezed her breast. Um, she was an unwilling participant in that. And if that took place, that's a sexual assault in my mind. And I feel terrible about it. It's been probably my worst week at work as a prosecutor and I've dealt with a lot of difficult things. Okay, let's go through the list again very quickly. We have the groping complaint, we have the drunken driving and boating complaints, plus a topless woman filing a complaint about being photographed when she was unconscious. That's four investigations that are underway now by the Chelan County Sheriff's Office. And we've also learned from these documents there was a fifth complaint filed by the same female prosecutor who says she was groped. She said a day later, another male prosecutor said he didn't want to stand too close to her because she was he was afraid. She was a he was afraid that she would accuse him of grabbing her. So that's five investigations in all. Mark Rowe, the prosecutor who's about to retire, I can see why he says this is his worst week on the job. Chris, this sounds like 18-year-old college students. Have you Doesn't ever it? seen yeah. anything like this in a prosecutor's office? Yeah, no, I haven't. Now, I have to say that Rowe does say that some of the people in the room were behaving responsibly. Some walked out. Mm. They did try to do something, but they were slow to do that. So, But yeah, there was a lot of conduct here that really just can't be justified. Wow. Okay, Chris Ingalls, thank you very much. Let's take a moment to evaluate your ethics level in this eight question self-evaluation. What would you do in these situations? Question one, at the end of a meeting, your boss compliments you for streamlining a reporting process. The idea was actually your coworker's idea who shared it with you over lunch. What would you do? A, thank your boss and accept the compliment. B, tell your boss that you have a lot more ideas that you would like to discuss later, or C, tell your boss that you thought it was a great idea as well, which is why you brought it up, but that the idea actually came from your coworker. The answer is C, tell your boss that you thought it was a great idea as well, which is why you brought it up, but that the idea actually came from your coworker. Taking credit for someone else's ideas and work is considered unethical. Give credit where credit is due. When we talked about omission, if you answered A, you would be omitting the truth. You may not be lying about anything, but there is more to the story that would give the full picture and may be pertinent. Question two. You are the last one left in the office for the night. You go to put your final notes for your presentation on your supervisor's desk. You see a file folder with your name on it. What do you do? A, ignore the folder and go about your business. B, 
peruse the file to make sure there is nothing negative about you in its contents. C. Take the file to your desk without looking at it until you are asked if you've seen it. Or D. Take it to your desk and send an email to your boss informing them that a file was left on their desk with your name on it and you have it at your desk now. The answer is A. Ignore the folder and go about your business. Even though you might be curious, it would be considered unethical to open and review the documents. Question 3. On your commute into work, you see a man shaving in his rearview mirror as he drives. You notice him sideswipe a parked vehicle and knock off the side mirror. He continues to drive. What do you do? A. Get the man's license plate number and leave a note on the damaged car with his information. B. Get the man's license plate number and call the non-emergency line to report the incident. C. Get out your camera phone to capture an image of him and narrate what happened so that you can post it on social media. Or D. Ignore it and continue your day. Either A or B are acceptable answers. A. Get the man's license plate number and leave a note on the damaged car with his information. Or B. Get the man's license plate number and call the non-emergency line to report the incident. Doing nothing is not considered ethical. Question number four. Your coworker accidentally broke your headphones when placing a box on your desk. They tell you they will replace them. You tell them how much they cost and they give you the money. When you go to buy the new set, you find they are on sale. What do you do? A. Pocket the extra money because it was an inconvenience for you to be out of your headphones and you had to go to the store on your own time to get new ones. B. Bring the change to the coworker since it didn't cost as much as you thought it would. Or C. Let your coworker know that it was actually cheaper, but you used the difference for the gas and time that it took to go to the store. The answer is B. Bring the change to the coworker since it didn't cost as much as you thought it would. This hits on the topic of integrity. No one was around to see that the item was cheaper. You could have financially benefited from the fiscal difference, but being honest about the cost ensures that your integrity is not compromised. Question 5. You've been providing services for a member of the community for some time. Their cousin works for Disneyland, and they want to offer you four tickets to the park because you have treated them so well. What do you do? A. Tell them that as a government employee, you cannot accept gifts. B. Bring three coworkers with you to the park so that you spread the generosity to more members within your department. C. Accept the tickets and raffle them off to staff in your department. D. Request some days off work and gather your family because you're heading to Disneyland. Or E. Talk to your boss and see if they can check in on the policy around accepting the gifts. The answer is A. Tell them that as a government employee, you cannot accept gifts. The truest level of ethics would fall under answer A. To ensure that there are no violations, simply declining the offer is your safest decision. E. Talk to your boss and see if they can check in on the policy around accepting the gift. This is not an answer that is off the table, as you are encouraged to discuss any decision-making conflicts with your supervisor, but the answer from the supervisor will most likely lead to their responses mimicking that of the answer to A. Question 6. You are in the break room and you find a $20 bill on the floor. No one else is around you, so you have no idea who the money belongs to. What do you do? A. Pocket the money, finders keepers. B. Use the money to buy some donuts for your department. Or C. Leave a note in the break room telling people that you found some money and you turned it in to the building lost and found. The answer is C. Leave a note in the break room telling people that you found some money and you turned it into the building lost and found. Make sure that you do your due diligence in trying to find the owner of the lost item and turn the lost item into the appropriate lost and found. Question 7. At the end of a work wellness campaign, you sign your tracking sheet and realize that you were one day short of meeting the commitment and won't be eligible for the raffle. What do you do? A. Enter in your challenge criteria for the missing day and sign and initial it anyway because you're sure that there were days within the challenge that you exceeded the expectations of the challenge. B. 
exclude yourself from this challenge, and decide that on the next challenge, you'll be more thorough and won't miss any days. Or C, leave the day empty, knowing that you are missing one day, but sign and turn it in anyway. The answer is B, exclude yourself from this challenge and decide that on the next challenge, you'll be more thorough and won't miss any days. You did not meet the criteria for the program and therefore you should not participate in the process for rewards. Question eight, you realize that you forgot to send out a shipment that needs to be received in a few days. You now have to send the package express instead of ground, otherwise it likely won't arrive on time. You realize this is going to cost a lot more money for the shipment. What do you do? A. Send the package express and don't mention it to anyone unless they bring it up with you. B. Send the package ground and tell your boss that the delivery service delayed the package and it won't get there in time. Or C. Go into your boss's office and immediately tell them of the issues so they can help you decide the best course of action. The answer is C. Go into your boss's office and immediately tell them of the issue so they can help you decide the best course of action. This is the most honest process. We will review a clip regarding an accusation of embezzlement that came after an employee had left the organization. She worked for the county for 35 years. Now a recently retired deputy clerk is under investigation for embezzlement. KXY4 North Idaho reporter Tanya Dahl has a story tonight from Coeur d'Alene. Tanya. Hold Dave, on a that's right. Police are looking into allegations that 140, nearly, excuse me, $140,000 may have disappeared on Sandy Martinson's watch. We all were talking about it at work and we're just pretty amazed. Sometime between January 2000 and October 2010, thousands of dollars slipped through the cracks at the Kootenai County Clerk's Office. It's taxpayer, it's our money and it's being embezzled. County Clerk Dan English contacted Coeur d'Alene Police on December 7th to let them know that $138,905 was missing. Kootenai County says the suspect in the case is retired Chief Deputy Clerk Sandy Martinson. When you have somebody that's in charge of public funds and taxpayer dollars, there's a certain level of um, observance there that I think we all want to have. Concerned about possible conflict of interest, the Kootenai County prosecutor forwarded the case to the Bonner County prosecutor who will file possible charges against Martinson. But we are looking at it very, very closely and carefully to see if there's something else that needs to be watched as well. While police wrap up their investigation, the unanswered question is how did this happen? It'll be interesting to see how that comes out and uh, I think it's even more interesting that nobody noticed for so many years because everybody has a boss so who's watching whom. The, bon the Bonner County Prosecutor's Office says Martinson could potentially be charged with grand theft and misuse of public funds. Both of those are felonies. Reporting live, Tanya Dahl, KXLY4, HD News. There are many different levels of ethics violations. Watch as we view an ethics violation with legal ramifications in fraud. A 15-count fraud indictment. There are six alleged victims and a bank. He's a free man tonight, but his tactical business is closed as part of the federal investigation. The feds arrest this Dodge County Sheriff's deputy in a suspected $11 million fraud case. While Craig Harbaugh was working as an investigator, he also owned Tactical Solutions Gear LLC in Fremont. The firearms business is closed, and court documents show Harbaugh filed for bankruptcy in July. Prosecutors allege the 44-year-old used his business in an investment scheme. Investigators believe he told people he had secured multi-million dollar contracts with the Nebraska State Patrol and Department of Defense. Here's the breakdown of the reported losses. The amounts ranged from $40,000 to $4.9 million. Court documents allege Harbaugh would falsify documents and photographs to convince his six investors and Great Western Bank he had wholesale orders for firearms, ammunition, and gear. Alleged victims reportedly communicate with Harbaugh through email and misspelled texts, such as this one. Thanks a lot for losing all of our retirement money. You just kept taking our money. No word yet where the alleged victims live or how Harbaugh met them. Great Western Bank did share this statement. The bank's policy is to not comment on pending legal matters. The bank has secured through a third party the inventory that was at the store, and we are fully cooperating with the authorities in regards to this matter. The Dodge County Sheriff says his office is also working with federal authorities and will conduct its own investigation into the deputy's conduct. Harbaugh was immediately placed on administrative leave. He was in federal custody until Wednesday, 
The judge granted him release while his case moves through court. The judge also ordered Harbaugh to turn in any firearms and also to stop contacting the alleged victims. If found guilty of all 15 counts, Harbaugh faces up to 320 years in prison. Rob, back to you. Oftentimes, when we think of public service ethics violations, the most extreme cases of fraud and embezzlement come to the top of our minds. There are many ways that unethical behavior can be illegal. In this case, we learn about the area of fraud by way of overtime violations. About 70,000 people work for the MTA. The amount of overtime some get has been an issue for years. Thursday, the U.S. attorney announced five current and former MTA employees are charged with extensive overtime fraud. The criminal complaints are against four LIRR crew members and a supervisor with the New York City Transit Authority. The MTA inspector general is cooperating with the cases. Since 2019, the MTA IG has been calling for reforms, monitoring new biometric time clocks, and tracking actual OT spending. State Senator Todd Kaminsky says the MTA has to manage money and make a better system. But to know that money is going into a black hole or even worse into the pockets of fraudsters is just maddening. One of the cases against a now retired LIRR track inspector found him to be the highest paid employee, alleging a $117,000 base salary plus 344 grand overtime. That equals $461,000. The five employees are accused of claiming between 2,900 and 3,800 overtime hours a year. That would average out to be 10 hours of OT on top of an eight hour shift each day for a year. These charges come as the MTA faces an estimated $12 billion deficit and its fare and toll increases are being considered. At Thursday's public hearing, the public gets a chance to tell MTA leadership to clean up the house and stop the waste. But I'm urging you to find other sources of funding and not use uh, the riders for it. I'm urging you to not um, use your customers to make up the difference. The MTA says it has saved 100 million in overtime in 2019, on track to cut 1 billion in overtime over the next five years. Managers now have a dashboard where they can see uh, almost in real time what overtime is being used. Uh, outside Penn Station, Greg Mocker picks. Here are some ways that you can handle situations that may question your ethics. You want to avoid common mistakes. You need to be able to develop a new mind and skill set. Think strategically, analytically, and always use your best professional judgment. Don't lose sight of the big picture and your obligations as a public servant. Don't neglect to recognize ethical performance and avoid correcting inadequate ethical performance. Don't neglect to keep your boss or human resources informed of unethical situations. Ask for help. Most people feel overwhelmed with a situation and don't reach out for support. Speak to human resources to get clarity on a policy that you may have questions about. Try to imagine your scenario as a headline. How does it play out? San Joaquin County offers several resources to employees to help support them in their role. We have required trainings to help support you in new employee orientation, workplace violence prevention, sexual harassment and discrimination prevention, diversity, respect, and inclusion, cybersecurity, and other security trainings amongst the myriad of courses that we offer in many topics. It's important to know who you should call and when. The one thing that you always want to remember is when in doubt, ask HR. You should contact your department's HR personnel analyst with any questions that you may have. You can also reach out directly as a first line of defense to contact your supervisor. They are there to ensure your success. Thank you for your role in ensuring the betterment of our community. Public service is a noble profession. If you can remember that you are in service to the community and all of your actions reflect that sentiment, as long as you make the right ethical choices, you will be well on your way to a wonderful career in public service. Thank you. Have a great day.